Thank you. You may be seated. What a wonderful thing to have is everlasting life. I've asked Brother Drew to preach for us tonight. Brother Mahaney, come ahead. Uh, he needs some experience. Amen. We'll give him a little chance to get a little bit of that. So, y'all holler amen, nod your head in agreement. Or if you'd rather, just fold your arms across your chest and scowl at him the whole time he preaches. Either way you want to do it. All right. Amen. Thank you for the, the privilege to be able to speak uh, or to preach. I wanted to, uh, before we start, I want to kind of give you guys an update on where we're at on, on deputation and whatnot. So, um, as of last night, we were sent the artwork for our pamphlets that we're going to be sending to pastors. Um, and so, hopefully, uh, there's a few changes that need to be made. Um, so, hopefully, once those get changed here in the next day or so, we'll have those printed back in our hands by next week and start sending those out here in the next couple of weeks and then uh, be praying for us as we plan on getting everything ready to start meetings by by Halloween is the goal um, so pray for us as we'll be getting all that stuff in our display boards and prayer cards and all those interesting things we finally got the picture worked out so everything's good on that um, but also be praying for me as we've decided to not quit work right away in February like we originally thought about. Uh, we just feel that it's that it's God's will and wiser to stay at work. So I'm going to be calling churches during my 45 minute lunch break and after after work at four o'clock. So um, pray that I can get a hold of several pastors and that we'll be able to, to book meetings up real quick during that time. Um, and then you know once May hits, we'll be full time calling pastors. Uh, so if you'll tonight go ahead and open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse number 24. Matthew 16, verse number 24. Before we read, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to be able to, to, to preach. I pray now that you would calm the nerves and would, would speak through me tonight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read verses 24 to 28. And it says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is, it, what is a man profiteth if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in his glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here, which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I want to focus in here on verse number 25 and 26. It says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit that he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So I want to use these two verses as our, our springboard to kind of talk about what are you willing to give up? And I want to actually go into the Old Testament. And we were joking, you can't really get doctrine out of the Old Testament. In, in Sunday school, a couple weeks ago, a preacher said, open to somewhere in the Old Testament. And when they said you can't get doctrine there. Um, and so, but if you'll go back with me, we're going to look at two men that were the servants and followers of a prophet. Two men that were the servants and followers of a prophet. If you'll turn back, we're going to start in 1 Kings chapter 19. And just kind of give you a little bit of background here. This is the story of Elijah when he goes to call Elisha to follow him. So in 1 Kings chapter 19, this is right after the the victory on Mount Carmel where Elijah had just defeated all of the prophets of Baal by calling down fire from God and destroyed the altar, lift up all the water. We know the story. And then shortly thereafter, Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. Within 24 hours, I'm going to have you the same as these prophets. And Elijah runs. I'm sorry, Elijah runs into the mountains and hides and tells God, just kill me now. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Just take me. And God says, no, there's, there's several that have not bowed the knee. And we're going to pick up the story here in verse number 19. It says, so he departed thence and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And when he 
with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the ox and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. So here we see Elisha is going to be the first man we're going to talk about tonight. This is going to be the, the pro side of our uh, of the message. And we'll talk about another man who is the, the con side of the message, the, the bad side. And so here we see Elisha. He The very first thing that I see when we're reading here is Elisha was a worker. He was busy at work. When Elijah passed by him, it said that he was plowing with the twelfth yoke of oxen and was plowing the field. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever plowed a field before, but it's, it doesn't look easy. I've never done it, so I could not, but I've seen it, and I've pulled plows and games at camps and whatnot, and it's not simple, it's not easy. And I've always heard it's like a lawnmower. If you don't find something at the far end to focus on, your lines are gonna be like this all the way down. And so plowing is not, not easy at, at all. And Elijah was out, Elisha was out here plowing his field, obviously for his, for his father. And there was other servants out there. And when Elijah came and cast this mantle on him, the very first thing that he does is he leaves. He runs and he talks to Elijah and says, let me go back and say goodbye and we'll leave. Now, when I first was reading over this, I thought to the, the man in the New Testament that says, well, let me bury my father and my mother, and then I will follow you, Lord. He wasn't saying the same thing. That man's, according to, to what I've read, that man's parents weren't dead. He was saying, when they're dead, then I'll follow you. But here, Elisha said, let me say goodbye. Let me let, me let them know that I'm leaving, and we're gone. And so Elisha went back, and he heeded the call of God. God threw the mantle, or God threw Elijah, threw the mantle on Elisha, and Elisha followed. Now, Elisha had a choice, and we all have choices. We can choose to obey that call or choose to ignore that call. And, you know, here we see Elisha chose to heed that call. He gave up all the comfort and stability of home to follow and travel after Elijah, to learn from God's word, to learn from the man of God how he should live his life and what he should do. And we read later on, Elisha asked Elijah to double, give him a double portion of Elijah's blessing. And we can read that Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah because of that. So we see here that Elisha had a choice. He chose to follow God instead of staying at home in the comforts. He turned completely to the call. And we see that here because he went back and after he went back from Elijah, it says, and he returned back from him in verse 21 and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments. So here it tells me that Elisha was all in. He went in and he completely destroyed everything. There was no going back to plowing that field after he followed the call of God. And that's in, you know, in our life. And Leela and I, we... We are comfortable right now. It's, it's really easy right now. God has given us an amazing job. She's now teaching at the school and loving it. And so it's, it's easy right now to, to be comfortable. But we know that the time is coming when that comfort is going to be ripped away. When it's going to be times, and my, my parents are great about telling us the horror stories of deputation. And, and how sometimes you're... You, get to the church and you've just used your last dollar on that tank of gas to get there and you're praying for a good love offering because you're not going to be able to make it to the next meeting but knowing that god will provide you know right now we don't we don't have to and it's going to sound wrong coming out but we don't have to trust god to take care of our bills the way that that we will when we're on deputation during the summertime our job is is very slow because we work with schools and so trusting God is a little more in-depth during the summertime. But during the school year, no problems. And so we have to learn now to put money back for that, to be able to, to be ready to completely pull away. My job is one that if you leave, you are not coming back. There, there are several that have left, 
and have not come back, or that have tried to come back, and they're like, well, sorry for you, you had your chance, we're done. Um, and so once we leave, there, there won't be going back to, to my job. And so here we see Elisha, same thing. When he left, there wasn't going to be a yoke of oxen, there wasn't going to be instruments for him to be able to plow the field there. And so he followed wholeheartedly God's call. He was prepared, and he, wouldn't, he, he prepared wholly and wouldn't quit. When he followed after Elisha, he followed, or after Elijah, he followed with all his hearts, and he wouldn't quit. And we see this if you flip over to the end of Elijah's life in 2 Kings chapter number 1 and chapter number 2. We read, we'll start in chapter 2, verse 1. So first, or 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah sent with, went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And if you keep reading through here, he tells him again at Bethel, Stay here, I'm going to Jericho. And Elisha says, No, I am not leaving you. And then in Jericho, Elisha tells him again to stay here. And the sons of the prophets say, hey, he's going to die. Are you sure you want to follow him and see this? And Elisha says, I'm going with Elijah to the end. And he eventually does go with Elisha. And he prays to Elisha. And it says here in verse number 8, it says, And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither. And so they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. If Elisha had chosen to stay behind, it's another one of those choices here that we can talk about, had chosen to stay behind in Jericho, or stay behind in Bethel, or stayed behind in Gilgal, he would have missed out on this blessing. He would have missed out on the opportunity to be used greatly by God, because he he but he decided to follow after Elijah, and we know the rest of the story. In verse twelve, it says, or in, in verse ten, Elisha tells him, "That's a hard thing that you ask, but if you see me when I go up, then you will have your request." And it tells us in verse twelve, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, "My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof." And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. So Elisha's story begins back in First Corinthians, or sorry, First Kings, First Kings chapter nineteen, where he gave everything and followed after God wholeheartedly, doing what God had commanded him. Now I know it sounds in depth, but it's not as deeply as as we might think. Put it on our level. Following God wholeheartedly doesn't mean going to Korea. It doesn't mean being the pastor of First Baptist Church of Baltimore City. Following God wholeheartedly may be teaching the teen department, may be leading songs. We all know how I did a few weeks ago. So I'm kind of glad that Brother Perry is back. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, a full-time evangelist. Doing God's will for your life could be something as simple as passing tracks out when you go through Brahms drive through yeah. Something as simple as coming to church on Tuesday night and going with a soul winner when we go out knocking on doors. Following God's will wholeheartedly doesn't mean that you have to give up your job and follow God to Zambia or to Mongolia or to Korea or anything like that. Following God's will wholeheartedly is by doing what he says to do in your life. We have simple things, reading your Bible and praying every day, which we teach our junior church kids every week. But there's more in-depth things. We have to be able to find God's will and, and do it for our life. Now, I want to move on here to 2 Kings chapter 5, just a few chapters over. We're going to talk about a man by the name of Gehazi. By a man by the name of Gehazi. And if any of you know who Gehazi is, he is the servant to Elisha. He's the man that's following Elisha around and helping Elisha. We read in chapter 4 that he was there when the Shunammite woman took them in. And, and Elisha promised that the Shunammite woman would have a son. And she had a son and then the son died. And then Elisha rose the, or brought the son back to life. He was there for all those things. 
But the story here, and I'm going to give you background so you don't have to read the whole story, but this is the story of Naaman. When Naaman comes from Syria and he says, I need to be healed, and the king of Israel rinses his clothes and says, who am I, God? Can I actually heal somebody? And then they say, oh, go to Elisha. Elisha will take care of it. And so he goes to Elisha's house and is told to dip in the river seven times and got angry because of something so simple. Salvation is simple nowadays as well. Trust in God. Here, Naaman was told by his servants, if he had told you to go do something great, you would have done it. But he told you to do something simple. So Naaman does it, comes back to the house and offers all types of gifts to Elisha. And Elisha says, no, I can't take it because I want you to know that it was God, Amen. not me, that healed you of your illness. But here in verse number 20, it says, but Gehazi. The servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian, and not receiving at his hand that which he hath brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. So Gehazi here, I see him in the same exact position that Elisha was just a few years before. He was in a position to be able to see God work in a position to be able to be used of God. But Gehazi made a decision. He made a choice. Elisha chose to leave everything and follow after God. Gehazi chose to leave God and follow after the world. Right. We see here that he followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from his chariot to meet him. And he said, is all well. And if you keep reading here, it says that Gehazi said, Oh, some people have come down from the mountains, and my master has sent me to, to get some change of clothes and some money from you. And so here, he steals from Naaman by lying and saying that his master had, or that his master has sent him. And it says that when he came to the tower, in verse 24, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master, and Elijah said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, Went not my heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money, and to receive garments, and all of yours, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, and manservants, and maidservants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman will cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. He went out from his presence a leper, white as snow. So here Gehazi made a decision and it kind of got worse when he decided to lie again to his master when he lied to Elisha. It shows an unrepentant spirit when he comes in and, and doesn't even hang his head. I know when I would do something wrong as a boy and my dad would find out about it, I would hang my head. I didn't, I didn't like disappointing my father. And so here Gehazi came in not even repented. I didn't go anywhere, he told Elisha. So Gehazi, he had great potential. He spent a lot of time with, with, with Elisha. We talked about the pres his presence there with the Shunammite woman when she gave birth to a son, even though her husband was of old age. We talked about when Elisha raised the boy. And even here in this story, we see he watched his name and came as a leper, probably wrapped up in all types of bandages to try to save his body. And then came back clean and, and pure and, and skin soft as a baby. And he saw this happen. But Gehazi chose to follow after the world. He chose to seek the things of this world. If you go back to our verse that we started in Matthew, is it better to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? You know, we don't read again about Gehazi except for one place in, Matthew, in 2 Kings chapter 8. When the Shunammite woman comes back from Egypt after the famine, Gehazi is called in to verify her story. That's all he's there for is a witness to the story of what God had done for her. And then he's not heard about again. He gets his eyes off of God and on the world. It's, let's look at um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 29 through 31. Matthew 6, 29 through 31. It says here, 
in Matthew 6, 29, 31, it says, And yet I say unto you that even Solomon was not in all his glory and not arrayed like one of these. I did write down the wrong verse. That's not where I wanted to go with that. But here we see that his, his thoughts were on earth. The verse I was looking that I was supposed to write down was the verse that talks about laying up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust doesn't corrupt. But laying, but not having treasures here on earth. Gehazi's treasure. Verse 19. Perfect. Okay. So let's read that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Matthew 6, 19. We'll read that so I don't have to misquote it for you. Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, so where thieves do not break through and steal. And here's the verse that I wanted to focus on. For where your treasure is, there your heart be also. Yeah. That's right. So here we see Gehazi, his heart was in the temporal things. You know, a lot of times I look at the churches today and see two different types of Christians. And normally it's Elisha represents the pastor of the church and Gehazi represents everybody else. Because Gehazi is the one that's focused more on work. How am I going to be able to make ends meet? How am I going to be able to do this instead of trusting God? Whereas Elisha was not concerned about that. Yeah, those things do worry us. Those things do worry pastors. I'm sure he thinks about his bills every so often. But he knows that God will provide. And we have to learn that as well, that God will provide even on deputation. So I want to look here. It says his error cost him everything. Because of his sin and his unrepentant heart, he was cast away. He was sent away with leprosy. Gehazi had the potential to be used greatly of God. Imagine if Gehazi had followed Elisha all the way to the end, just like Elisha followed Elijah to the end. Imagine if Gehazi was able to be there when they stood up on top of the, of the tower and saw the entire Assyrian army around him and was able to see when God opened his eyes saying that their, the hills were filled with the armies of God. Imagine if Gehazi was there all the other times when Elisha's up on top of the mountain and, and they send 50 troops to come and get him and he calls down fire to kill them. He sends 50 more and he calls down more fire to kill them. So not one, but twice he called down fire from heaven. And then the 50th and the last 50 came and said, Oh, Father, we're sorry. Please come with us. Imagine if Gehazi could have been there. And we could be raving later on in Kings about how he did great things with all these kings and how he caused all these great things to happen with, with, with the work of God. But all we hear about Gehazi is he's a witness. He comes in and says, yes, that's the Shunammite maid that we took care of. And that's all we hear about Gehazi. So is your life going to be like Gehazi? Someone that, that is used greatly by God, not just a missionary, not just a pastor, but someone where when you get to heaven, they're going to say, you gave me a track one day when you came through McDonald's. And I read that track and got saved. Someone that's going to be used by God to win someone like D.L. Moody to the Lord. His Sunday school worker felt worried about him and went in to talk to him and led D.L. Moody to the Lord. And we all know who he was. But not many people know who his Sunday school worker was. We need to be more like Elisha, willing to do what God wants us to do, even though sometimes it seems hard. Sometimes it's hard to love that McDonald's worker. They've had a long day, and you go through, they're done. Their shift is almost over. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to love your coworkers. I've been there. Sometimes it's hard to love those that are around you, to love the unlovable, but God calls us to, to reach them. Both of these men were workers. Gehazi was a servant to Elisha. He followed Elisha, did everything that Elisha asked him to do. Both worked under a great prophet. Elisha under the prophet Elijah and Gehazi under Elisha. But both took two different, track, two different paths. Gehazi chose to follow the things of this world and was never heard from again. He wasn't used of God like he had the potential to be. Elijah chose to follow the man of God and follow God's will all the way to the end. 
And then he was given a double blessing of what up to that time was considered one of the greatest men of God. We read about Elijah and he doubled everything that Elijah did. We talked about the two fireballs instead of one. He, he did twice as what Elijah did because he was faithful to the end. He was faithful in doing what God called him to do. In your Christian life, are you the Gehazi Christian or are you the Elisha Christian? Are you one that is trying to reach those around you, trying to be used by God in every aspect of your life? Or are you one that's more, more focused on what's going on around? And you're going to be one that stands by and goes, yep, God used that person to do this. That's the person that did it. And just be a verifier as opposed to the person doing, doing the work of God. I want to challenge you today to be like Elisha, to give God everything. Don't look back over your shoulder. Don't back off of what he's called you to do. Be an Elisha. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this message that you've laid on my heart. I pray now that you would help um, in the invitation, that you would work now in hearts. I pray that you would uh, guide now. In Jesus' name, amen.